Hallelujah. Well, hey, two weeks ago, as we continued in our series, Why Do the Righteous Suffer? We began part two entitled, remember we broke it down and we're breaking it down into really five parts of what it is in Job. And this part, part two is the dialogue. And so uh, we started out in the beginning with, a, with the prologue and we got, that was the introduction. And then we're going to keep going right on through. And so, um, but I shared some character traits of Job's supposed three friends who after seven days and seven nights, remember they were quiet and they sat with him in silence and then uh, f- following all of his great losses, he had all these things that were taken away from him and they sat there and they were with him. But, and uh, I mentioned how it was a Jewish tradition to be silent uh, with the person who was mourning until that person spoke. And so they were there just being there for Job. And so uh, but I think they might have been thinking about a few things during those seven days because they had a lot to say when it was over. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you that right now. And so uh, his three friends did that really good, but as they began to speak, uh, they shared what was on their mind and it revealed what was in their heart, didn't it? And uh, sometimes not so pretty things are in our hearts, right? And uh, so Eliphaz appears to be the ringleader and uh, he is quoted the most of the three friends. He believes that righteous people prosper and wicked people suffer. And uh, he accuses Job of two things, that Job's a hypocrite and that he's guilty of sinning against God. I'm right there, guys. I don't know about you guys, but I'm right there. I'm guilty of both of those things, right? Come on now. And uh, I think we all are. If we be honest, we're all guilty of those two things. And so, um, and so the, the second so-called comforter, his friend's name was Bildad. I'm glad I don't have that name. Uh, But unlike Eliphaz, who shows up in four chapters of Job, he shows up in three chapters. And while Eliphaz was was harsh with Job, at least he delivers his message with some discretion. That always helps too, right? Not so with Bildad. He comes at Job ready to fight and looking for, uh, he's looking for an argument. Have you ever known any type of people that come at you and they're looking for an argument? Have you ever known anybody like that? Husbands, don't raise your hand. Not right now. This is not the time to raise your hand, husbands. Not right now, please. If you want peace in your home today, just keep the hand down and keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. Amen and amen. But sometimes we've been that person that's been looking for an argument and looking for a, uh, to go after somebody. You know, I know I have. I'll just be honest with you. And I have. And, and uh, I've been one of those type of people at times in my life. And so Bildad just says, what he's thinking, and he doesn't use any discretion. He's just all out there, and he's letting it rip, as we would say, right? And he accuses Job of making a lot of noise that doesn't change God's justice. That's what he's telling him. And so he's wanting Job to admit that uh, it's because of his own unrighteousness that his suffering is caused because of his own personal sin. He uses logic, he uses tradition, and he even uses nature to support his opinions. And then there's the third friend, Zophar, and uh, Zophar, Zophar, no, anyway. And it's, <laughs> so these are weird names, man. I don't know where they come up with these names, but there are three recorded speeches in the book of Job for Eliphaz and Bildad, but Zophar only gets two. As I said two weeks ago, he's ranked third and he gets the bronze medal, okay? He's the meanest and he's the nastiest of all three. He's the kind of guy who says things and then has to take his foot out of his mouth. Has anybody ever done that or known anybody that's done that? Amen. He's similar to Bildad, only worse if that's possible. He starts out by ridiculing Job and he, and he, and he agrees with the two other guys that Job's suffering is due to his personal sin. He even went so far as to have the audacity to say that Job has suffered, hasn't suffered enough. Think about that. You haven't suffered enough. Oh, thanks. That's just so much soothing comfort for all that I've been through. You just thank you. Put the salve on. Put the oil on, right? It's easy for him to say he's not in Job's shoes, is he? Right? He also said, God has even forgotten some of your sin. Thank you. Appreciate that. Just keep throwing it on. I'm thinking those were not the most comforting words along with anything else they said or what the other two had to say, right? It sounds like all three are just heaping on the condemnation, the shame, and the guilt. The last thing Job needs at this point in his life, right, is that very thing. With friends like that, who needs enemies, (laughs) right? All this dialogue makes me ask the question as to why did God allow so much of the book of Job, 24 of 42 chapters, to be centered around this dialogue with his three friends? You know, thinking about that, they're airing out their opinions about Job on Job to his face in all these 24 chapters. 
And as I think about, as I said earlier, I think about the entire Bible. I think I can't picture anywhere else that even comes close to this in the Bible. Uh, There's so much dialogue, you know, it's just going on and on. And, and it seems like a bunch of lengthy verbiage, right? With, with talk that seems not to be benefiting anyone, really. Especially when most of their advice is either wrong or off a little bit, right? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the book of Job as we thank you for every book in the Bible, all 66 books in the Bible, God. There's a reason and there's a purpose for every word in the Bible and in the Old Testament just as much as the New and back again and all the way through it from Genesis to Revelation, God. We thank you for the word of God. Speak to our hearts today, Lord. And Lord, whatever you're speaking, help us to change and do whatever you're calling us to change and do. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said... Amen. Hey, tell someone why we continue on. Tell someone God's still great. Come on, tell them. Tell them you like it. I mean it. God's still great. Amen. Hallelujah. So why is there so much dialogue? Well, we're going to get some, we're going to throw out some ideas and see what we, what we can come up with here. So for, <clears throat> for starters, there was a really strong and common belief in that day with the culture that the righteous do not suffer. Only the unrighteous suffer. That was huge in that culture. And if there was one common theme or thread to what all three of these guys are saying, it is this. You, and, if, and think about it. If you're a lawyer in a court case, you're trying to overturn long-standing legal precedences, right? You're not going to put forth some kind of weak argument, okay? And so this is something that's been in the culture, you know, the righteous don't suffer, okay? So but in that court case, if you're a lawyer, instead you would want to present a lot of evidence to present your case, wouldn't you? These guys are now entirely perplexed and confused because here's Job, a very righteous man, having, having to suffer some of the deepest tragedies and the deepest trials and the deepest pains in life. It blows their theology out of the water. Has anybody ever had your theology blown out of the water? Right? Come on now. Sometimes that happens. And so... The people of that day had options as, as to how they should respond to what seemed clearly to be a dichotomy. It doesn't seem like this thing matches up. It doesn't seem right. They could push harder and break down stronger against Job's dialogue in, in their theology of what they call retribution, that the unrighteous are the only ones that suffer, not the righteous. And as they continued to do, or they could do that, or they could accept what he said, or he, what he was saying as possible truth. Maybe there's truth here. Job's friends didn't even consider the possibility that, that, there, that there could be an exception to the rule. Do we ever get a little crusty where we think, well, no, this is the way it is, and this is the only way it is, and uh, it's the only way it is. Even though it's a gray area in the Bible, we, haven't, we don't know for sure. We're going to stick to our guns, and that's the way we do it. That, that, that dominant thinking of the culture, that, that maybe that was flawed. They didn't want to think that, that maybe this the way we're thinking could be flawed. Because if they were to do that, it would stir up uh, many more uh, theological uh, questions and possible confusion, right? They would have to examine and rethink how they saw the relationship between God and human suffering. The thought that only the unrighteous suffer is easier to process in one's mind, isn't it? Because it has, it has all to do with their sin, right? Right? And I, I, I've got this, we kind of think sometimes, I got this all figured out. Case closed. Don't talk to, I don't want to hear it. I got, I got it figured out right here. That's it, right? Uh, if, 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 just, if a just God does allow suffering, then you have to explain how that happens, don't you? How does that happen? These three so-called friends didn't want to go there, right? They really didn't want to go there, as we would say. They didn't want to open up that can of worms, because it's a whole lot easier a lot of times to keep the lid on that or God sometimes. Easier to keep the lid on God. Let's not let him out of the box. He might start healing people. He might start delivering people. He might start casting out demons. He might be doing all this stuff. We don't know what to do with it all. Oh, no, Lord, help us. We'd rather just put the lid on. God can do this, but he can't do that. Let's, let's just control him and keep him in his box. God says, let me out of my box. Don't put me in a box. The more you put me in the box, the more I'm going to come out and show you who I am. I'm God, and you're not. Hallelujah. But these guys stuck to their guns and because it allowed them to give a universal and easy answers to difficult questions. And as Christians, don't we do that sometimes? We get to thinking and seeing things only one way when maybe God has a different way for us to view something. Now, just before you, don't get all crazy and think I'm a heathen preacher. I'm not talking about the absolutes of Scripture when I say that. 
There is absolutes in Scripture, okay? There is that. But, and, th- and those things are great, and we, we stick to those things, okay? But those things are absolutes. But I'm not talking about our doctrine, but the way we might view something solely based on culture or family tradition. That's a different story than what's the Word of God. Just because something's in our culture doesn't mean it always lines up with here. Something in our family tradition doesn't mean it always lines up with here, right? If something is not black and white in Scripture, there needs to be flexibility, doesn't there? You know, I'm not going to come to you and say, well, you can watch this movie, you can't watch that. I'm not, I'm not going to be the movie police, okay? That's where you got to get before the Holy Spirit and say, God, should I go to this movie? Should I not go to this movie? Should I go to this thing and do this, or should I not do that thing? That's, that's God's place, not my place. I'm not the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, if you're doing stuff that's way out there and it's great, I'll probably have a little conversation with you, okay? And say, you know, this probably isn't God's best thing for you, but, but, but there's a lot of gray areas, and we've got to seek the Lord on those things. And so seek God and examine ourselves and to do what God is showing us in those things. And so we're not to look down on others who see it, might see it a little differently in some of those areas that aren't black and white, right? We are only going to be answering to God for who? Ourselves at the end of the day. Concerning staying true to the word of God and in the absolutes. But stay true to the absolutes, absolutely. <laughs> How's that one for Stay true to the absolutes, absolutely. That just came out anyway. And seek God for direction concerning the gray areas. So I'm not talking about blatant sin or her- heresy here, okay? So don't go there with me. And So yes, there are absolutes, okay? The Ten Commandments are the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to say, well, you know, if you think you should kill somebody, go kill No, that's not where I'm going with that, okay? All right. So sometimes our thinking and our actions are not based on God's truth and can keep us from reaching souls for Christ. They can. I've tried to answer that question in previous messages as to why do the righteous suffer? Of course, there's a lot, we've been going through a lot of things, but... All these years later, thousands of years after the a book of Job was written, we know that all, the, that all through Scripture, righteous people suffered, didn't they? Think about it. You can go all the way back to guys like Abram and Sarai, Sarai before they were named Abraham and Sarah, who had to suffer some degree just waiting for the promise of Isaac. Yeah. Think about that. Kind of came up in Sunday school today. It was like it was starting to be, my message was starting to get preached back there. I thought, all right, just take, go on, take it. How about Joseph, who didn't deserve to be sold into slavery and put into prison unjustly? In fact, Joseph did the right thing by not sleeping with Potiphar's wife after, he repeated, uh, after her repeated advancements, right? That couldn't have been easy. I mean, think about it. Joseph could have been saying, gosh, I'm doing the right thing. What's up with this, Lord? I mean, God, I was doing the very right thing, and then I get mistreated. Look what I'm now I'm in prison. And I, she did this. and uh. No, no, no. He didn't do any of that stuff. Joseph becomes the warden before long because he's still going after God, doing God's will, doing God's plan, and moving forward with God. Hallelujah. So she, she so how, and, and of course, she covered up her, her own sin, Potiphar's wife, and turned on him and, and uh, causing him to, him to serve many years in prison for a crime he didn't com- commit. Think about that. Yeah, think about that. And then how about David, who was a man after God's own heart? David did nothing but honor Saul, and yet Saul came after David to kill him. Think about that. And what about the apostles and Paul in the New Testament? They suffered greatly for doing what was right by sharing the gospel and doing what God called them to do. Once they finally got it, they went and told people the good news of Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear that the righteous will suffer. Of course, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar didn't have the Bible to read in that day, of course, right, as we do today. But when you think about it, the nations all around Israel had no problems with explaining this phenomena away because their gods were, were just random, right? They just did things on personal whim without any reason or system, did they? They didn't see their gods as, as just as they were, right? They were just like, eh, whatever, it didn't really matter. But Israel, on the other hand, saw their God as just, which he is, and he was I- incapable of being unjust, Right? That's true, but once again, we have to remember, they didn't know what was going on in the heavenlies, did they? In that God was vindicating Job, was he? wasn't he? And they also didn't know how Job's life would ultimately end up at the end, did they? They didn't know that. So there were some things they didn't know. Deuteronomy 32, 4 puts it all in perspective for us. He, God, is the rock, right? His works are perfect and all his ways are just. There you go. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Hallelujah. 
To that I say, amen, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. There are some theologies out there, like open theism, that thinks that God does not know the future and is not in control of the events of the world. As believers, we know differently. These false doctrines arise for the very same reasons that Job's comforters continued to endlessly come to him and dialogue with him for 24 chapters. Their argument that the righteous, su the righteous suffer and not the unrighteous it, it, yeah, I say that right. The argument that the righteous, not the unrighteous, is strictly a cultural interpretation, okay? They thought the righteous shouldn't suffer. And that was their view of God. And just because the culture thinks a certain way doesn't mean that always lines up with Scripture or God's character. A second reason, possibly, uh, why there's 24 chapters of dialogue is it reveals more about Satan and his nature. How many of you need, you know, think about it. If you know your enemy, you know how to come against him or know how to prepare for him or know how to come at, come at him and not allow him to come at you, right? The book of Job starts out with Satan's his cha he's challenges, his challenges. He's challenging the integrity of God. Thereby, he's ch and challenging the integrity of Job as well. He's both the villain and the adversary. After chapter 2 of Job, Satan disappears. However, that doesn't apply that he, Job, or Satan is nowhere else to be found in the book of Job, right? We know today that he is a great adversary. He's our adversary. He brings up these, uh, the, the case against Job, and he really brings it up against God, doesn't he? Using the example of a trial in court, Satan puts together this uh, human legal team to prosecute his case and to add to his suffering. This is not 1-800-CALL-SAM, okay? It's 1-800-CALL-ELIPHAZ, BILDAD, and, and ZOFAR. So far, right? That's what it's been, exactly. And of course, uh, his team is Job's three so-called comforters. In the first couple of chapters, and, or rounds as I called it a couple weeks ago, right? It's like a boxing match. Satan takes everything from Job, including his children, his livestock, his servants, and his good health. And after that, that, as I said in an earlier message, he goes for round three, continuing to pummel him through the arguments of his three friends. The irony of all this is that they think their arguments are vindicating God and helping Job, but in reality, they're advancing the cause of Satan, aren't they? And afflicting Job with more suffering. That's all they're doing. Is doing this, that's all they're doing. This onslaught of their arguments are geared towards pressing, pressuring excuse me, Job to let go of his integrity, which is the exact goal of Satan. He wants us all to let go of our integrity, doesn't he? he of course he does. The enemy tries to do the same to us often, to give up. What's the use? You've been faithful to God, and look at your life. Look at your circumstances. Look at your relationships. Look at your health. Look at your finances. God's not there for you. Abandon all this nonsense and live it up. Just live for the world. I have two words for you to tell Satan this morning. Shut up. Yep, I did say it. Shut up. When he comes at you, don't take this stuff lying down, okay? Okay. Stand up to his lies and declare God's truth. And where is God's truth declared? Right here is word, the word of God. Hallelujah. Not only do these three guys, these three so-called comforters, not bring comfort to Job, but if he would have done what they were suggesting, it wouldn't have led him out of his suffering at all. Not only that, but if he would, he would that have confessed sin, uh, think about it, that he never committed just to give in to his friends or to get relief from his affliction, he would have lost his integrity as well. Don't give in your integrity for other people. Don't give in your integrity for other people. They'll try to pull you back. They'll try to pull you into the world. Don't be pulled back in. You stand strong. Even when it doesn't look good, stand strong. Stand firm. Now, let nothing move you, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 15, 56. But stand strong, let nothing move you, right? Stand in the Lord, hallelujah. And so you've got something that is greater than they. They're just, they're just kind of jealous, and they just know that you got it, but they want it, but they don't really want it, so they come at you. Don't let them come at you, amen? Hallelujah, you stay strong in the faith. And that, and that is the testimony that you have right there of who our God is, that he's faithful and true, hallelujah. So stand strong. Possibly a third reason that this dialogue goes on for 24 chapters. Could it be it reveals more about who God is? 
Not everything that these three knuckleheads said, that's the first time I call them knuckleheads, but not everything these three knuckleheads said about God was inaccurate. Not everything was inaccurate. In fact, there were numerous things uh, said by two of them, especially Eliphaz, and that reflect God's character and glorify God. In his first dialogue with, with, Job's, uh, with Job, Eliphaz is quoted as saying these words, and I'm going to read from chapter 5. I guess you could say this is our opening verses as we get uh, down into the message quite a ways. Uh, these are, this is chapter 5. I'm going to start, it should be up here on the screen, but I'm going to start reading with verse 9, and this is what Eliphaz said. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Amen. Miracles that cannot be counted. Hello. He bestows rain on the earth. He sends water upon the countryside. Hmm? That's right. The lowly he sets on high, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. I could show you scripture verses that back that up. He thwarts the plans of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. I could show you stuff in Proverbs that shows you that verse. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the why are swept away. Darkness comes upon them in the daytime. At noon, they grope as in the night. He saves the needy from the sword <clears throat> in their mouth. He sa saves them from the clutches of the powerful. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts its mouth. Blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. Amen. Folks, that is our God right there. Amen. That is not. Amen. Give him praise. Hallelujah. That is, that is nine verses of truth about who our God is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And so after these verses, he goes on to state that God will rescue him. Well, that's, that's correct. And in verse 19, no ha harm will befall you, Job. As we follow God, no harm is going to befall us. That God does not allow. So even if we go to be with Jesus, it's okay. It's our time. It's okay. It's all right. It's all good. We're going to go be with him anyway. So, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so in all these verses that I read and the ones that I didn't read, all but one lines up with the scripture mostly, and a lot of them are in Psalms and even some of those are in Proverbs as well. So Bildad, in his discourse with Job in chapter 25, stated that dominion and awe belong to God. Amen? Yeah. And to God that he established order in the heights of heaven. That's true. Amen? We'll give him that, how true that is. And the fourth thing that these 24 chapters of dialogue reveal is, number four, if you're taking notes, that there is similarities between the suffering of Job and the suffering of Jesus Christ. Satan did all he could to get into the ranks of Jesus' friends, better known as his disciples. He tried to creep in there, didn't he? We read in the Bible how Peter tried to persuade Jesus to take an alternative path other than the one that was his father's will uh, that was through the cross. He said, no, no, look, Jesus, you're not, basically in Ken King version, you ain't doing that, you ain't going that way. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. You know, it's like, yes, I am going that way because that's God's desire and that's where I'm going. And so you're not, and that, of course, that was right after, like I said last week, right after he got the revelation, you are, you are the son of the living God. You are, you know, the Christ. And so, you know, we can, us humans, we can be right on one minute and we can be way off the next minute. We're, we're kind of out there, right? We're just, yeah, that's why we're sheep and he's the shepherd. Because we're bad, and a lot of times we're bad and over here. He's like, get over here, get back, get over here, bad. We got to get moved into the center again. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Thank God we got a God that loves us and disciplines us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so after pre Peter tried to deter him, like I said, he goes, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. See, we need to continue to be mindful of the things of God. When we get think mindful of things of men, we start messing up, don't we? We start messing up when we get mindful of things of man. We got to keep mindful of the things of God. How's God seeing this right now? How does God look at this terrible situation I'm going through right now? What is God? How does God see this? If we start looking at it that way, our terrible situations won't be so terrible anymore. Jesus is seeing Satan trying to creep up in the words of his friends. And in a different way, Jesus would experience suffering later on because of his cl three closest friends and their actions, wouldn't he? Even though Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to remain with him and pray with him, think about this, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was at his most desperate time, what are they doing? They're falling asleep. They fell asleep. 
Think about that. This was his greatest point of need. He's sweating drops of blood, and they're, they're falling asleep. Nice. I'm so thankful I got these guys around me. They're such good support to me. Jesus is looking for some comfort from his dearest three friends, and they've fallen asleep on him. Oh, God, help them. But like I said last week, aren't you glad God chose uh, fallen vessels? It gives us hope, doesn't it? It gives us hope because if if he can use those apostles and the disciples, if he can use them, he can use us. Today, we're no different. We put our foot in our mouth. We do all sorts of crazy things, but God still uses us today in all of our stuff, in all of our weakness, in all of our sin, in all of our stuff. If we keep our eyes on the prize and keep going forward into his will, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He asked them to be there for him for a little bit, and they let him down with total indifference, total indifference. They displayed no, little to no compassion for him. Not only that, but worse yet, Judas would betray him. The disciples would all desert him as he went to the cross. Peter would deny knowing him three times. Think about those friends. Oh, he poured into these guys for three years, the 12, and look what happened. After he poured into their lives for those three years, Jesus is left alone to the wrath of God, left alone on the earth without anyone to feel his suffering or know what he was going through. Hmm. A similar thing occurred to Job before it happened to Jesus. Unknowingly, unknowing to them, Job's friends take up Satan's cause and help to increase his suffering. Nice, not nice. Had they known what they were doing, I think they probably wouldn't have done what they did, but their theological blindness played this big part. That the righteous can't suffer? That doesn't happen. Only the unrighteous suffer. But they unknowingly advanced the cause of Satan. See, they think they had all the answers, but really they were part of what Satan was trying to do to to Job. They came to Job with the thoughts of consoling Job, but they tormented him probably the most of any of his afflictions. If somebody was coming at you, three people were coming at you after you went through all through that, that would be terrible. Think of the hurt and the pain and the rejection. Remember, like I said a couple weeks ago, sticks and stones might break my bones, my names will never hurt me. That ain't true. Who came up with that silly lie? That's, that's a lie. Those things do hurt when people say stuff. And when they do stuff to you, they hurt bad. Come on. And so this stuff hurts. So if you, if you ever had somebody come to you with all the right intentions, but what they delivered your way or how they delivered it wasn't helpful, it can cause a lot of pain and a lot of heartache, can it? It really can. And as I start to wind down this message, <clears throat> there is two more similarities I want to mention before I bring this thing to a close. Job's three friends and Jesus' three days in the grave both represented darkness and defeat, didn't they? Think about it. This is the worst that it gets for Job other than a seven-day period maybe where they were quiet, a little reprieve of silence from these three friends. But things have gone from bad to worse. Not looking good for Job. He doesn't see the end at this point. He's just saying, wow, my life was great and now it's terrible. That's what he's seeing. Not only had he lost his children, his servants, his finances, his good health, but now he's being pummeled by these three guys. He's like, like I said, the boxing match. He keeps coming out, bam, boom, you know, pow, bang, you know, all that stuff. It's like kind of like the old Batman, you know. But, I mean, you ever had to feel like that in life? You're just like, oh my word, I got up. Or, or what was that one guy that kept coming up? You hit him and boom, he falls right back down, you know. It's like sometimes we feel like life is like that. It's like the pow, the bang, the boom, right? It's all we're getting, you know. And so these three guys are attacking his character and accusing him of being the reason for all of his suffering. Wow, nice. Physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, this guy, Job, is being spent. He's just getting nailed to the T, to the the nth degree. He's being attacked in every way possible to where he cursed the day of his birth 19 times and has turned that into into, uh, wondering why he was even born. Wondering about the day of his birth, like, why did this even happen? I wish it didn't happen. I wish my mother wouldn't have had me, all those kind of things. Everything appeared forever hopeless and lost. And for all practical purposes, as anybody would view his circumstances, all in, and all that he was going through, it did appear hopeless and lost with no way out. You ever felt that? I just feel lost and hopeless with no way out. Well, ever since you became a Christian, you got a way out. You got a way in and you got a way through. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Give God praise. Amen. You'll always have not only a way out, but you'll have a way in it and through it and by it. Hallelujah. 
But he was suffering tremendously inward, inwardly with all the disappointment, all the loss, all the rejection, all the pain. Think about that. There was a lot of things going on. As well as, think about it, he was suffering outwardly. He had boils on his skin from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. I mean, you talk about going through it. Man, this guy was, is a man who was marked with affliction outwardly too. Not fun. At the end of Jesus' life, he is being physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually spent, you think? The religious leaders and the people had turned on him, including his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, who abandoned him at his greatest time of need. The people and the guards mocked him. They spit on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head, and they beat him and made him carry his own cross, and then they nailed him to it. It got so bad that even though that Jesus knew it was the Father's will for him to go to the cross, he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Not my will, but yours be done. He was thinking of you. He was thinking of me when he said that. Hallelujah. At Gethsemane, just before he would be arrested, his soul was filled with sorrow to the point of death. And Luke observed that Jesus was sweating blood in contemplation of all that was to come. All our sins, the sins of the whole world, were put upon him. Think about that. He who had no sin became sin for us, didn't he? Oh, man. What an exchange. What an exchange. Everything appeared forever hopeless and lost for all practical purposes. As anyone who viewed his circumstances and all he was going through, it did appear that there was no hope and there was no way out. He was also suffering tremendously inwardly with his own disappointment, his loss, his rejection and pain, as well as outwardly with the marks on his back from the beating that he, that he the scourges and the, and as they beat him on his back, he, he suffered there. The marks on his head from the crown of the thorns, right? And now the marks on his hand and his feet from being nailed to a cross. He is clearly marked with affliction, as he breathed his last breath and was dead for three days, it all ended in darkness and defeat. But God, but God, Job's three friends, what they had to say at that time was not the end of the story, right? Jesus' three days in the tomb was not the end of the story. Hallelujah. Job's good life would eventually be redeemed and restored and Jesus' life and the spiritual life of all mankind would be redeemed if they chose him in a right relationship to God, the Father would be restored to them. There's always hope in Jesus. Nothing is ever, ever fully lost or hopeless in him. There's an old hymn that states, my hope is built on nothing less on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. How true. If you're not standing on the solid rock of Jesus Christ today, that can change right now. Would you bow your heads, everyone, with me and, and close your eyes, if you will, in the sanctuary here. And There's hope right now. If that's not a part of your life, it can be. Because the solid rock wants to be under you and, and giving you hope and giving you a, a firm place to stand. And so if that's not you today, what I'm going to ask in a minute with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Lord, or maybe you're watching this on video and you're watching this on your couch and you feel maybe hopeless, maybe you feel like there's no hope, there's always hope. That hope is in Jesus Christ. And today you can know him as your personal Savior, personal friend. He's a personal friend. He wants to come inside and he wants to live with you and just talk to you and love on you. And so today, if you don't know him, and I'm going to ask this in this, and in fact, if you're watching this on video, the same thing. If you don't know him, just why don't you acknowledge that right now? If you'd acknowledge that right now, all I want to do is pray. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. If that's you, just say, Pastor, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. If that's you, you just raise up your hand real quick and put it right back down and just let me know and say, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. Okay, you can put your hands back down. And we're going to pray with you as a, as a group. And so those of you watching by video too, we're going to pray what we call what we call a sinner's prayer, which we many of us has pray, already prayed in this room. And so we are going to pray that today. And uh, you're going you're gonna to come out different because you're going to give Jesus Christ the opportunity to come and reside in your heart and your life today. So if you'd pray this prayer after me, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. 
for me and rising from the dead. Forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I want to live the rest of my days for you. I love you, Jesus. Take all of me and do what you want. Change my heart and change my life. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said, amen, amen. Give God praise in the house today. Hallelujah. They're rejoicing in heaven. Let's rejoice in the church today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, for those of you that raised your hand, come see me after. We want to get you a booklet called Brand New. And if you did that on my video, it's called Brand New. It's going to help you walk with God for the next 30 days of your walk with God. It's a, it's a new believer's devotional, and it's going to help you grow in your in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So come see me after. They're, they're out on the narthex in the lobby there. You can grab one of those. But uh, praise God. We rejoice in the Lord. All heaven's rejoicing, and we rejoice as well. Hallelujah. And we are going to go out singing that old hymn. Hallelujah. We're going to sing it. Lord, bless your people this week. Bless them. Give them divine appointments with people. Lord, that they can invite Wednesday and next Sunday to come into the house of God. And we give you thanks and praise, Lord, for being such a great, great God. Here we go. Let's sing this as we go out and go in the joy of the Lord where you feel to go. But otherwise, worship the Lord. Amen. My